You guys see that OK? Yeah. All right. Uh, OK, um, so I've been tasked to talk about metabolic liver disease. So let's see if this is going to work. There you go. So learning objectives today uh, is to understand, you know, general pathophysiology of some of the metabolic liver disease, uh, particularly the ones that uh, we see here uniquely. Um, you know, creekland ajar tyrosinemia, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, MSUD. I have bile acid synthesis, but I think I move those to the very end, and, and only if we have time uh, can we get to those. But if anybody's interested, happy to talk about those. And then uh, understand the conceptual basis of liver transplant decision making uh, for these metabolic diseases. Um, you know, and so when talking about transplant, right, we want to kind of understand the risk benefit ratio uh, for a given patient with a specific disease. Uh, and in order to do that, we really have to understand the pathophysiology of the disease uh, as well as its natural history. Um, we have to recognize the general assessment of a patient with these diseases as well as the outcomes of liver transplantation. Uh, we have to look at transplant as a potential as a metabolic cure uh, versus a, a Band-Aid or a bridge uh, therapy. Uh, and then we also have to think about alternative and potential future therapies that may be coming down uh, the pipe. So again, pathogenesis of metabolic liver disease, this is that classic med school diagram of all the biological pathways uh, in the body, all interconnected, you know, very overwhelming uh, and, um, you know, kind of makes you want to curl into a ball and cry. So I think, you know, you can get a lot more simplistic. Uh, this is a kind of again a Google image, <clears throat> excuse me, of uh, you know the, the metabolic pathways uh, in the human body, um, a little bit more simplified. But even this, I think, can be overwhelming and probably a little bit too complex. And so when I think about metabolic liver disease, uh, I really try to think about it as simple as possible. And and the way I think about it is that there is a substrate uh, that the body has. Uh, and it needs to go through a series of processes using various enzymes uh, designated by the E to get to an end product. Uh, and, and when you think about it this way and you, you kind of think about different diseases in this light, uh, for me at least, it, it becomes much more, much more manageable. Uh, and so when you have a metabolic disease, in general, one of these proteins may not work well. Uh, and if it's a more proximal protein, you may see increased substrate. And that's what you're going to measure. And that's how you're going to uh, assess whether or not the patient may have one of these diseases. If it's one of the intermediate uh, proteins, you may see, again, one of these intermediate metabolites that usually under normal circumstances may not be present, but will be increased uh, in a child who has certain metabolic conditions. And obviously, if it's one of the more distal proteins, you can get both intermediate and substrate buildup. But sometimes what we measure is a decreased end product. And if we're looking for, again, evidence of disease process, uh, you know, these are the different ways in which we will think about um, uh, what we are looking for when we when we review test results. Uh, and then there's transplant, right? Uh, and, and how transplant fits into this whole process. So again, this is a little bit older data, but if you look at the Children's Hospital Pittsburgh experience, again, two graphs here, the one on the left is the first six years of the program from 1980 to 1986. Uh, and then you see kind of the subsequent 20 years from uh, 1996 to 2016. And I think if you focus specifically on the metabolic liver diseases, one of the things you can see is that this um, uh, you know, is a substantial amount of what we transplant here. Uh, and it may even be higher than this. Oh, get rid of that, sorry. Uh, may even be higher than that uh, if we looked at uh, more current data. So again, if you actually break that down for the metabolic diseases that we transplant, again, this is from 1981 to 2018, uh, you know, and focusing on the diseases that we'll talk about today, you see that, again, alpha-1 antitrypsin, uh, MSUD, uh, kriegland najjar as well as tyrosinemia is a substantial portion of the disease populations that we see and that we transplant. Obviously, the PFIC conditions, Wilson disease, and some of the others uh, are here as well. So, you know, George and the group uh, a while back in 2014 put together this <clears throat> paper for molecular genetics and metabolism. And, you know, the main message from this paper is that, you know, liver transplant for metabolic liver disease uh, have, has improved over time. I think not surprising, uh, you know, these types of graphs could likely be shown for any disease in transplant. But, you know, in the early 80s through 90s and into the aughts, uh, what you can see is that there's been progressive improvements in, uh, you know, patient and graft survival uh, for, for patients who've been transplanted for metabolic liver diseases. 
Uh, Pat, when he was here a couple of years ago, looked at more uh, of the, the UNOS OPTN data at this and, and wanted to kind of describe some of the evolving trends in liver transplant for metabolic liver diseases. Um, and I think what, what Pat did that was interesting, and I think what we all recognize is that, you know, not all metabolic liver disease is the same. Uh, <clears throat> And, and how we categorize these are uh, in patients who had metabolic liver disease where the defect uh, was solely, you know, kind of defined within the liver, uh, who didn't have any extrahepatic liver disease. Uh, defects that were uh, confined within the liver but also had extrahepatic disease. Uh, and then you had, you know, extrahepatic defects where liver transplant, um, you know, may provide enough protein supplementation to provide benefit. Uh, but may not be kind of overall cures and those patients who had both uh, intrahepatic and extrahepatic liver disease. Again, focus on the ones we're looking at. And I think ultimately, and I think not overall surprising, is what he saw was that those patients in that 1B category, right, so the ones that had, uh, you know, evidence of synthetic liver dysfunction, uh, and, you know, liver disease, as well as extrahepatic manifestations, um, you know, they did the worst. And so when we think about that graph that, um, you know, George and Jerry put together from the first paper, you know, what, what has been overall driving improvement are patients who don't really have underlying structural liver disease and have uh, their disease kind of contained within the liver. But those patients where there is structural liver disease and extra hepatic manifestations, uh, again, these are patients, uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, PFIC type 1, uh, methylmalonic acidemia, propionic acidemia, these patients, uh, there are still improvements to be made. Um, so if we go back to kind of our, our uh, diagram of how we're going to view uh, metabolic liver diseases, again, the first disease process that we'll talk about today is quigley najjar syndrome. Uh, this one's pretty easy, right? Because the substrate is unconjugated bilirubin. Uh, your end product is conjugated bilirubin. But for this one, there's really only one enzyme whose job it is, is to do this process. And it's the UDP glucuronyl transferase or the UGT1A1. Uh, and when you don't have UGT1A1, what you're going to see is a dramatically elevated unconjugated bilirubin. And so that's how we measure it in these children. Again, just another pictorial of the, the uh, way in which bilirubin is processed. Again, uh, bilirubin comes from the breakdown of your red blood cells. It gets picked up uh, by albumin and carried to the liver. Uh, that is the unconjugated form. And in the liver, that UGT there, its sole purpose is to conjugate bilirubin in order to allow bilirubin, uh, conjugated bilirubin to be excreted into the uh, uh, bile ducts. When you don't have UGT1A1, you're going to get dramatic elevations in unconjugated bilirubin. So what are the clinical manifestations of kriegler najjar So jaundice within the first days of life. Uh, generally, total bilirubin levels will be a uh, greater than 20 milligrams per deciliter with a low conjugated or direct fraction. Uh, again, for any of us who have worked in the newborn uh, nursery, uh, we understand or can recognize that you know, levels of 20 is you know, well above two or three standard deviations of what you would expect uh, from the kind of normal uh, hyperbilirubinemia that we see uh, in, in children uh, uh, for, for a variety of different physiological reasons. Generally, uh, the, you know, these children are described as having, quote, normal liver enzymes. When you look at their ALT, their AST, and their GGT. And, and historically, again, they've been described as having normal liver biopsies. Uh, I think Ellen Mitchell, when she was here a few years ago, um, you know, kind of put together this paper, uh, which, you know, I think really for the first time actually uh, allowed us to recognize that, you know, uh, there may be actually some liver injury. And so she actually looked at patients who uh, underwent liver transplant here, reviewed their explant histology, and showed that actually a substantial portion of these patients actually had structural liver disease. I think the mechanisms of this are likely multifactorial, but uh, the sense that, that uh, we now think about these children as having completely normal livers has probably changed a little bit. Um, these children are generally described as having pigmented stools. Again, uh, important when we're thinking about the differential of hyperbilirubinemia uh, that, that uh, we assess for stool color. Uh, and then the diagnosis can be made either based on bilirubin measurements, the clinical course, uh, direct enzyme measurement of the UGT1A1 activity, uh, but more likely than not, now it's genotyping. Um, you know, I think the rapid speed in which genotypes can get turned over, uh, we now recognize greater than 130 mutations that can lead to this phenotype. And I think most patients probably have genotyping uh, to, to secure their diagnosis. Uh, again, what are some of the other clinical manifestations of Krugnajar? This picture here represents uh, the most terrifying one, uh, and that is Kernicterus. Uh, this is also referred to as bilirubin-induced brain dysfunction or acute bilirubin encephalopathy. Uh, it's notable that this is possible at any age. I think a lot of people think that this is only a process that can occur uh, uh, at the very young, but this is really something that can occur uh, at any point along their clinical course. Uh, 
Uh, why does this happen? Uh, so again, this is a picture of the kind of normal functioning brain. And what you see here is that you have a blood brain barrier uh, that is protective. Most of your unconjugated bilirubin uh, when it is at normal levels is bound to albumin. Uh, and so therefore stays within the vessels and is not able to get across the blood brain barrier. Um, but when you have uh, elevated unconjugated bilirubin, you exceed the capacity of albumin to bind it. Uh, and so that bilirubin is able to cross the blood brain barrier. Uh, it gets into the uh, the neural tissue and causes uh, inflammation and destruction. Uh, symptoms of cronicorus are, are those of CNS deficits, so posturing, hypotonia, seizures, fever, hearing loss, spasticity, and cognitive dysfunction. Uh, it is generally thought that this is irreversible. So when patients uh, do suffer uh, a, a neuro uh, hit from cronicorus, we generally think that, that that is an irreversible injury. What are the medical treatments of preeclampsia? Again, phototherapy is the staple. Um, obviously, uh, easier done when the when the baby is an infant. Um, uh, you know, but as children get older, uh, people have to think of adaptive ways in which we can continue to provide this therapy. And so, again, uh, there's a picture of a toddler, and this is even of an older child. Uh, you know, where they have now you know built and devised these um, uh, UV light uh, beds, essentially, where these sit over the uh, the patient and the child while they're sleeping. Um, you know, why does this work? Well, it is because there is this very narrow band of uh, UV light, uh, which can actually convert uh, unconjugated bilirubin to a structural isomer, which can then be excreted in the urine. Uh, and so this is why uh, this uh, therapy is effective for these patients. Um, other uh, medical management, and you know, this is more uh, kind of um, uh, knowledge than, than therapy, but, which is to avoid uh, you know, bilirubin displacement. Uh, off of albumin. So again, most of the bilirubin is being uh, carried by albumin where it can. <clears throat> and there are certain substances, mostly uh, drugs, uh, that can uh, compete for that binding of albumin. Uh, and you don't want to use a drug that's going to um, uh, more preferentially bind albumin and knock that unconjugated bilirubin off. You'll increase that uh, and increase chances of, of uh, uh, cronicorus. And then exchange transfusion. So the, in, in um, emergent instances, you can take these patients in, put uh, access lines, uh, and uh, essentially filter out the unconjugated bilirubin. Uh, again, Kevin Strauss put this together about a year ago uh, and is really kind of a, a tome on Krieglinajar. And if anybody's interested uh, to, to uh, you know, really dive in deep into uh, the pathophysiology, the natural history, uh, and, and potential future therapeutics, I think this is an excellent uh, manuscript to do that. Um, but just a few you know, kind of key points from that, one of which is that you know, we recognize that this medical therapy over time becomes less effective. So again, these are individual patient dots. Um, you know, there is this bilirubin to albumin ratio uh, that uh, Kevin has described uh, above which patients are a substantial risk for cronicorus. And so again, you see here early on, there's a lot of babies who, who kind of reach that threshold, not because it's necessarily that they're younger, but because they're probably undiagnosed uh, and so they, they come in with high bilirubin levels. But the point here is that over time, even with optimal therapy, you see that these patients inch closer and closer to that, uh, that one mole uh, per mole line, uh, which is, again, the kind of theoretical threshold that Kevin and his group have described uh, that really increases one's risk of developing pernicorous. Uh, there are several reasons behind this, one of which is there's kind of an overall decrease in body surface area that occurs over time um, as we grow our body surface area that is uh, available to phototherapy gets less, our uh, skin gets thicker, blood volume increases, and so there's a variety of different factors that contribute to this. But all of this is to say that as these patients uh, get older, um, there is a continued significant risk of cronicorus as well as factoring in some of those quality of life factors um, uh, when you think about, you know, phototherapy where patients are having to receive 12, 15, 18 hours of phototherapy a day in order to control their ability with levels. And so this is where transplant has come in. Uh, this is one of the earlier experiences from transplant in Krieglin and Jean. Again, relatively small numbers of patients, 21, 6, and 5, uh, but ultimately showing that uh, transplant is an excellent therapeutic option. Um, you know, again, the initial uh, uh, papers describing transplant for Krieg Nujar, you had 18 patients uh, receiving a, a liver transplant, uh, two required retransplantation. There was an overall 94% survival. Uh, three did have irreversible brain injury going into the transplant that did not improve. Um, and this report did note that there, there seemed to be some variable improvement in some patients. Uh, but I think that the, the uh, the party line, I think, for, for patients who are coming in for transplant is that we would not expect any uh, deficits that have been accrued uh, to, to improve necessarily. Um, 
you know, I think Rakesh Sindhi uh, kind of pulled the UNOS uh, database to look at more broadly this experience. Again, uh, 67 patients with over 30 years of follow-up. Uh, you know, I think just focusing on that 10-year graft and patient survival, you see graft survival at 81%, patient survival at 96%. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, there are other therapeutic options other than whole organ transplant. This is auxiliary liver transplant. So, again, a report from the late 90s of this. Again, I think Simon's on the call and could speak more to this. We don't have much experience here with this. Um, but it's recognizing that, you know, what you're trying to do with liver transplant for metabolic disease is really provide enough protein supplementation of whatever deficit uh, the patient may have. And so it may not be that you need to supply an entire organ, uh, but maybe just part of an organ uh, that would allow a patient to, present, to uh, presumably uh, get to a point where they may be at less risk uh, for any of the, the complications of their underlying disorder. So here you can see in the picture, uh, what they do is they essentially split the liver in half. Uh, they keep the native liver in uh, and hooked up as it were, and then they put in the auxiliary graft uh, which is in general a left lateral segment uh, into the patient uh, to provide some protein supplementation. Uh, so this experience had seven patients that received an auxiliary liver transplant, oh sorry, seven auxiliary transplants in six patients. Uh, five of six were long-term survivors. And again, this is for Krigner Najar, and what they saw is that the follow-up bilirubin did fall uh, to one to two milligrams per deciliter. So, you know, again, still a little bit high, but nowhere near what would be a dangerous level. Uh, obviously, the advantages to an auxiliary liver graft is that you develop a complication of transplantation, uh, graft rejection, um, uh, you know, primary non-function, any number of kind of uh, uh, you know, issues that we deal with long-term. Uh, you know, you can let the graft go, uh, and you still have your native liver in place um, and kind of revert back to your natural state. Um, I think, uh, you know, there are other therapies that are in the pipeline that are always uh, needing to be discussed. Again, this is hepatocyte uh, transplantation. Uh, so again, this was the initial case that was described in a 10-year-old with Kriegler type 1. Uh, he was receiving 12 hours of phototherapy going into his transplant. Total bilirubins were 24 to 27, so dramatically high. Um, he received, again, 7.5 times 10 to the 9th hepatocytes. Um, he got FK and prednisone, kind of a standard immunosuppression post-transplant. Uh, uh, they uh, did note that there were conjugated bilirubin uh, that measurements that, that had happened afterwards, uh, suggesting that these hepatocytes were doing uh, something. Uh, his phototherapy needs decreased from 12 hours to 6 hours, which, again, if you could think of quality of life, is actually a dramatic improvement. And total bilirubin had dropped to uh, 14. Uh, Zah Khan, when she was here, uh, kind of put together uh, this review of kind of the um, uh, overall experience of hepatocyte transplant for Kriegler Najar. I won't go through it in detail other than to suggest uh, that these patients uh, variably had some response, although by no means was hepatocyte transplant a cure at this time. Uh, gene therapy. Gene therapy is another kind of um, uh, potential therapeutic that is talked about a lot and has a lot of hope. Um, you know, this is a transplantation of normal genes into cells in place of the missing or defective ones in order to correct the diagnosis. Again, uh, a lot of these gene therapies are using these adenoviral vectors to do it. Um, there's a lot of advantages to these vectors, including the fact that they've got low ge general pathogenicity overall. Uh, they are up, you know, kind of taken up by both dividing and non-dividing cells. Uh, they are not integrated into the host genome. Uh, these are relatively liver specific, so they get the genes where they need to be. Uh, the immune response is overall mild, and you can produce these in large amounts. Um, uh, there is uh, animal models that suggest that this may be possible. Again, this is mice showing that, uh, you know, with varying uh, in, you know, doses of adenoviral vector um, uh, that were supplied, uh, you can see that the conjugated bil or the total bilirubin levels decreased dramatically uh, in, in those that had, you know, increasing uh, levels of, of, uh, uh, of, of virus uh, given. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, currently, uh, you know, we kind of can think about hepatocytes uh, in its current state is a bridge to transplant. I think in all honesty, you know, I think these programs, there was a lot of excitement probably 10, 15 years ago. Most of them have actually probably shut down. Uh, you know, we've been trying to get ours uh, back up and going here for uh, uh, not necessarily Krigner-Jar, but a couple of other different diseases, um, but there's been challenges. And again, viral viral therapy, viral gene therapy, um, you know, uh, there's still a question mark about how this will, will uh, ultimately be factored into the care for these patients. So again, transplant decision analysis for uh, patients with these types of diseases. So, you know, you have to balance the, the potential as a metabolic uh, cure, the specter of conicterus, the quality of life that these patients have uh, versus, again, the, the 
um, uh, the risks of transplant, right? Uh, there is a risk of death in transplant. It is not a benign procedure. Uh, there are comorbidities related to transplant. There's a commitment to transplantation, right? Uh, as it relates to, um, you know, uh, perioperative care and long-term care. And then future developments, as we talked about, hepatocyte therapy, gene therapy. Uh, you know, if you go get a whole organ liver transplant now and gene therapy becomes available in five years, that's not going to help you. Uh, and then cost. Transplant is by no uh, means a... Um, uh, a uh, inexpensive uh, intervention. So kind of moving on uh, disease processes, right? I think now we're going to talk about tyrosinemia. Um, so in this instance, tyrosine is our substrate coming down the pike. Our, our end result is going to be fumarate. Uh, and it's the enzyme uh, that, that is defective is one of the more distal ones in the process. And so what we see and what we measure in these pa uh, patients is some of the intermediate metabolites that clue us in uh, as to the diagnosis. Again, here's a picture of the metabolic pathway. Uh, again, you see tyrosinemia at the top, you see fumarate at the bottom, uh, and it is this, uh, you know, kind of more distal protein, uh, the fumaracyl acetal to acetase, I can't ever pronounce it, uh, that is defective in patients who have tyrosinemia. So you get increased uh, in their intermediate metabolites. Um, it is notable that it's not the, you know, kind of most immediate metabolites that we measure, but it's actually those metabolites that get uh, subsequently processed to succinyl acetone. Uh, that really uh, allows us to, to cue into this diagnosis. So there are um, you know, various forms of tyrosinemia. Again, there's the acute form, uh, which is liver failure prior to six months of life. Um, this generally presents with neonatal hepatitis and on pathology, you see a micronodular cirrhosis. Uh, again, here a picture of a normal uh, liver uh, with its uh, architecture in a patient who has tyrosinemia of the acute form. Again, I think you can appreciate these um, you know, micronodular circles that have formed in these patients. There's a subacute form, uh, which presents more uh, vaguely with failure to thrive, hepatomegaly, uh, rickets, renal tubular acidosis. This is sometimes referred to as hepatorenal tyrosinemia. And then there's a chronic form, which again, you'll have uh, rickets and hepatomegaly, uh, but hepatocellular carcinoma is the most devastating complication uh, of this and really any form of tyrosinemia. Um, you can also have porphyria-like symptoms with parathesias, autonomic dysfunction, and paralysis. Um, so again, how do we uh, assess these patients and what clues us into their diagnosis? Uh, obviously, you'll get elevations in the serum tyrosine in these patients because of the block in the more distal um, uh, protein defect. Uh, but this is really nonspecific. I think there are a lot of different processes where you may see elevated tyrosine. So tyrosine levels alone are not what we typically use, uh, but it is really the urine uh, serum evaluation of succinyl acetone uh, that we use as our diagnostic. Again, this is filtered over to the uh, kidneys, but we pick it up in the urine, and then that's how uh, we're generally clued into a diagnosis of tyrosinemia. Um, you know, what do you see from a laboratory standpoint? Again, you see evidence of metabolic liver dysfunction, so you'll see abnormal coagulation. Uh, but in general, these patients, particularly in that uh, neonatal acute form, will have left less evidence of biochemical injury, right? So they're older than the gold kids, right, the gestational alloimmune kids, but uh, they will, can look a little bit similar in that they'll have some profound acute liver failure and coagulopathy, but their liver enzymes will be somewhat bland as it relates to their elevations. And then very high alpha beta protein. Again, a lot of these patients do develop hepatocellular carcinoma, and so we will watch for, monitor, and measure that. Again, serum amino acids are suggestive. Urine succinyl acetone uh, is diagnostic. Um, you can also do skin fibroblast enzyme assays for diagnosis, and then again, uh, as, as is the case with all of these disorders now, genotyping uh, is possible and growing. Um, notably, this is picked up on the PA newborn screening, and so several of these patients now are coming to us, uh, you know, having been diagnosed on newborn screening, which is obviously a huge advantage and, and a, a very great thing for these patients to be picked up before they're symptomatic. Because uh, there is a treatment that we can intervene upon, right? Uh, so again, this is really, really old stuff, but again, showing uh, you know, what the outcomes are for these patients based on when they presented, right? So if you presented with that neonatal form less than two months, uh, your survival was terrible, 25% uh, in five years. Uh, the two to six months and greater six months, you did a little bit better, right? But still, uh, overall survival for these patients was really atrocious. Um, and so uh, what was discovered was that this um, uh, compound NTBC, or nitazone, um, uh, was discovered, which actually blocks uh, the, the uh, metabolic pathway uh, higher up, preventing some of the buildup of the uh, more uh, devastating intermediate metabolites. And so uh, what is known is that, you know, appropriate intervention with NTBC, uh, you know, does, does lead to a rapid reversal of all aspects of the disease. Uh, 
Uh, the dose is typically one milligram per kilogram per day. It blocks about 99% of this more proximal protein in the process, um, and you want to maintain the zone levels between 40 and 60 micromoles per liter. Notably that you will still get elevated tyrosine, uh, even with appropriate NTBC treatment. Uh, this can build up in the um, eyes and cause ocular problems. And so ultimately the treatment is both NTBC and a low tyrosine diet to prevent some of the other complications of this process. Um, again, Pat put together this kind of review of uh, liver transplantation for type one tyrosinemia uh, in the UK when he was over there. Um, Transplant indications in tyrosinemia, obviously acute liver failure is a clear indication uh, for considering liver transplant in these patients, uh, but also and in, in likely um, uh, more commonly is the suspicion for HCC. Um, you know, any patient who has been difficult to control or uh, had early, uh, you know, control difficulties or a late diagnosis, even once they are stabilized with the NTBC, generally acute liver failure doesn't become a complication, but HCC remains uh, as a complication. And so we always watch for uh, alpha feeder protein levels in these patients and uh, imaging uh, so that if there is a, a mass that um, uh, becomes apparent that is suspicious, liver transplant should be considered. Okay, we're going to move on to alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, deficiency. Um, so I think a lot of us uh, may think of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency more as a lung problem uh, than a liver problem, but it's not. Uh, it is important to know what the alpha-1 antitrypsin protein does, right? Uh, so this is a protein whose action is in the lung. Uh, it is a neutrophil elastase that acts as a protease. Um, or sorry, no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a protease inhibitor, right? So neutrophil elastase is the protease that's pro-inflammatory in the lung, and the alpha-1 antitrypsin protein is an inhibitor of that uh, so as to decrease the amount of overactive uh, inflammation that can occur in, in lung as it's exposed to various toxins uh, smokes, perfumes, and things of that nature. So again, what you can see is in patients who have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, uh, you know, they will lack that uh, anti-inflammatory component, therefore having uh, more overreaction to certain insults and more lung damage. Problem in the liver is that, uh, and why the liver is involved, is that this protein is made in the liver uh, and then travels to the lung where it, where it has its effect. Um, uh, and so I think that, you know, uh, what happens in the liver, we'll talk about here in a little bit, is that that protein ends up getting trapped in that trapped protein can cause liver, de uh, liver uh, destruction. Uh, so alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, again, it's the most common genetic cause of liver disease that we identify. It does affect about 1 in 1,800 uh, folks in the U.S. As noted, again, this protein functions as a suicide inhibitor of the neutrophil proteases in the lung. Um, and the mutations are characterized by isoelectric focusing. So again, when we talk about alpha-1 antitrypsin, a lot of times we'll talk about protein levels. We'll talk about phenotypes, and we'll kind of go over what that is. Um, but normal quote, uh, phenotype is the M phenotype. Uh, with that, the phenotype that associates with the liver disease being the Z phenotype. And so when we see these measured, again, we measure them as the PIZZ or PIMM. That PI stands for protease inhibitor, again, uh, underscoring the, the function of what the alpha-1 antitrypsin actually does. So again, you know, showing that the normal MM uh, uh, phenotype on the left, you kind of get this balance. If you have MZ, uh, you know, uh, in the lung, there may be some, uh, you know, effects of having some lower protein circulating. Uh, uh, but, the, uh, you know, that this just showing again that, that MZs and also ZZs uh, for sure need to avoid things like smoking where you're going to get your lung damage. Again, this is just a picture of that isoelectric focusing uh, showing essentially, you know, the way that these are run for those who haven't done Western blots is you take a protein, you isolate it, you put it in the gel, uh, you put an electric current through it, and you see how far this thing travels across the gel over a period of time. And all this is to say is that there are any number of different phenotypes that may pop up. So we'll send off a phenotype and we'll get PI, all kinds of crazy things, C, Z, Duarte, you know, there's, there's uh, several, you know, dozens uh, of different um, uh, protein uh, phenotypes that may come back. Uh, again, this just suggesting that the Z phenotype uh, is one that uh, travels, you know, a certain distance and then gets um, uh, specified as that as that Z phenotype. Uh, so this is an autosomal recessive uh, disease process. Um, so when we see a child who has a ZZ phenotype, we generally suspect that the one Z came from mom, one Z came from dad. Um, it is important to recognize that there are again, uh, you know. Uh, patients out there who are, quote, null for alpha-1 antitrypsin, right? So these are patients who actually make no protein at all. Um, and so, you know, but it, it's notable that in these patients, so they make no protein, but because they make no protein, they actually have no liver level, no liver disease, uh, uh, obviously no serum level, but they get terrible lung disease. Uh, 
Um, uh, you know, whereas the ZZ phenotype are the ones that we worry about from a liver standpoint, they actually are making protein. So they make it and there is a liver level. And if anything, it's elevated because that protein is trapped in the liver. And we'll talk about that. Uh, they may or may not have liver disease. And I think this is important as well and something that we'll talk about here in a little bit. The serum level is generally low. And so we'll cue us in uh, when we're following, uh, when we uh, see a child for the first time and check a, a serum alpha one level. And, you know, they, they may develop lung disease later in life, but it's not generally something that we worry about, particularly in the pediatric age range. So, again, this is the process by which alpha-1 antitrypsin is made, okay? So, it's, it's a protein uh, that's made in the Golgi uh, and in the ER. Sorry, it's made in the endoplasmic reticulum. It's then packaged, uh, goes to the Golgi where it's kind of um, uh, adapted, folded, undergoes some processing, and then it's ultimately secreted out. Um, uh, notably, for those who have, uh, you know, the ZZ phenotype or the ATZ patients, you know, the, the, the pathology here is actually abnormal folding, right? Uh, so when you have this Z phenotype, uh, you end up um, not being able to fold the protein correctly, and so it gets trapped uh, in, in the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, notably, right, uh, there is a process whereby when we misfold proteins, we are able to get rid of those misfolded proteins. And this process is called autophagy, and we'll come back and talk about that. But under normal circumstances, you know, our bodies make millions of proteins a day, probably. Uh, and inevitably, sometimes that process goes wrong. And so when it goes wrong, you have something like autophagy that's able to kind of recognize that misfolded protein and get rid of it uh, so that it doesn't cause any long-term damage. And so it is this process that autophagy that we actually think is critical uh, to the development of liver disease and why we think that some patients actually develop liver disease and others do not. And so this was really understood uh, by Spegger uh, in his kind of sentinel work back in the 70s. And so uh, he's from, I, I forget which of uh, those kind of Nordic countries uh, up near the Arctic Circle, but he essentially took, you know, 200,000 newborn uh, infants and just screened them all uh, for their phenotypes. And what he saw was that, you know, of the 200,000 kids, 127 had a PIZD phenotype. So again, an instance about one in 1,600. But notably, uh, when he looked at the 127 patients, not all of them had liver disease, right? Um, uh, so, all, you know, 52 of them were actually completely normal, had no evidence of liver dysfunction, uh, no cholestasis. Uh, 53 of them had an increase in the ALT, uh, and 22 of them were cholestatic. And what was important about this is when he followed these patients out over time, uh, what he saw is that those that ended up having poor outcomes were the ones that were cholestatic at birth. Uh, the ones who had, you know, mild liver enzyme elevations or were normal uh, had actually really great outcomes. And this is kind of demonstrated again in his follow-up paper. And so what that led us to, to understand is that it's not just having the ZZ phenotype, uh, but that there is a second hit uh, that likely contributes to the development of liver disease in these patients. And what we think that second hit is, is in the process of autophagy. Um, you know, and so again, what you see here on the top is what would happen normally if you have an abnormal folded protein where it gets you know, picked up, degraded, broken down and recycled. Uh, whereas if you can't do that, if you can't uh, undergo autophagy or some of the other processes by which these abnormally folded proteins are, are broken down, it builds up in the liver and that's what ends up causing the damage. Uh, again, I think that the mechanisms to this are still under investigation. There's a lot of work uh, that is being done to try to better understand this because there's potential therapeutics that are involved. Uh, what are these clinical manifestations? Neonatal cholestasis, again, as we talked about, uh, happens in the minority, but is a common way in which these patients do present. Or do present. Uh, you have increased conjugated bilirubin and transaminases. Obviously, you'll have a chronic hepatitis with increased transaminases, and you can develop cirrhosis over time with an enlarged liver, large spleen, uh, evidence of portal hypertension. Uh, again, we generally diagnose this by the PIZZ phenotype. Um, uh, it's important to counsel all of our patients to avoid smoking uh, in general, really, but, but those with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency for sure, because they are at risk for lung damage, uh, although likely later in life. It is notable that for the lung disease, there is protein um, uh, therapy that can be given. Oh, sorry, I'm still, still going here. Um, so there is enzyme replacement for the lung disease. You can actually take a, an alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, protein into the lung in order for it to act locally on the lung. But this doesn't do anything for the liver disease because, again, the liver disease is not caused by protein deficiency. It's actually caused by buildup of abnormally folded protein that can't get out. Uh, 
Um, but there is hope, uh, right? So going back to our graph, there are various medications uh, which are you know, pro-autophagic, um, uh, which are being studied in various settings to try to understand if you can uh, increase the body's ability to break down these abnormally folded proteins. Uh, but as it currently stands, there is no FDA-approved therapy for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Carbamazepine is one of interest uh, because we had been studying it here for a while. Uh, so in general, it is supportive uh, therapy for those who do have significant phenotypes of liver disease. Uh, again, uh, antipyretics, fat-soluble vitamin supplementation, uh, cholorectics, and monitoring for complications of end-stage disease. Okay, um, sorry, checking the time. So uh, what are the indications for liver transplant for these patients? Um, uh, so again, decompensated liver disease kind of makes it easy if they start developing abnormal coagulation, uh, low albumin, elevated bilirubin levels. Um, you do need to monitor for HCC in these patients as well. Really, any patient with uh, a chronic liver disease and cirrhosis is at risk for development. Um, and you know, just to kind of note, there is some controversy about taking an MZ phenotype um, uh, as it relates to living donor liver transplant. Uh, we have a recent experience here, and there are others, and I think most people now will recognize that, you know, taking an MZ donor, uh, again, if, if you have a child with this disease, likely the parent is going to be an MZ phenotype. Um, uh, we do not consider that to be a problem uh, as it relates anymore, although uh, some, some people have reported there are issues you need to monitor for. Okay, uh, we're going to move on now to maple syrup urine disease. So this one gets a little bit more complicated because there's actually three substrates that we're worried about. Uh, with three different end products. But the good part is that there's one, one enzyme that we need to worry about, but that enzyme has three parts. Uh, so the, uh, the, the branch chain amino acids that we uh, are watching for are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Uh, the enzyme that is defective is this branch chain keto dehydrogenase enzyme complex, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the uh, substrate or the uh, uh, end products that are there. Uh, they, they don't really have much of an importance. Again, notable that just this branch chain keto dehydrogenase complex does have three different parts. Uh, defects in any one of these three parts can cause the phenotype of maple syrup urine liver disease. Again, just another pictorial uh, showing again your leucine, your isoleucine, and your valine, uh, you know, kind of coming through this branch chain keto, keto dehydrogenase complex, the bottleneck uh, to where they get processed. Uh, and it is just notable that when that doesn't work, you get elevated branch chain amino acids. Uh, similar to the tyrosinemia, it's not necessarily just leucine, isoleucine, and valine buildup that causes the problem, um, but is actually, oh, sorry, to, to, to get to that a second. So again, diagnosis is suggested by elevated branch chain amino acid levels, uh, and an alloisoleucine is, is somewhat considered uh, pathognomonic for this. Uh, but again, as I was alluding to earlier, it's not just necessarily the leucine, the isoleucine, and the valine, but it's actually the intermediate product of this, uh, this alpha keto isocaproate. Uh, it is this guy that's actually able to uh, across the blood-brain barrier and cause the neurotoxic uh, effects that we see uh, in these patients. Again, diagnosis can be made on fibroblast or lymphocyte testing for the enzyme activity. Uh, uh, again, most patients now just get uh, a genotype with, with genetic studies, and the treatment is dietary therapy, uh, mainly consisting of protein restriction and avoidance of catabolism, again, with these branched-chain amino acids coming from uh, protein. What are some of the um, uh, clinical symptoms of this? Uh, so in a metabolic crisis, you can develop encephalopathy, cerebral edema, and stroke. Uh, death can occur as well. Um, again, this is one of these diseases that seems to be more difficult to control with advancing age, and reasons behind that aren't entirely clear, uh, but does seem to be something that we see in our population. Again, neuropsychiatric problems are uh, a very common comorbidities such as ADHD, anxiety, panic, depression, and many others. Uh, can complicate the clinical picture for these patients. Uh, you know, liver transplant for MSUD is kind of one of my favorite stories to tell, particularly you know, some of the med students and stuff where I give this talk to, because uh, it was really an accidental discovery. Uh, so in 1997, there was a patient with acute liver failure uh, that was unrelated to MSUD. It was actually a protein toxicity. And this is actually one of the Lancaster patients that we uh, currently still care for. Um, uh, so she presented with ALF, uh, and because of her ALF, I got a liver transplant. Um, and what they saw after liver transplant was that she actually developed normalization of her amino acids. Uh, and this happened even on an unrestricted diet. Now, people had thought about uh, liver transplant for an SUD, 
because we knew that there was a protein uh, in there, uh, but it hadn't been performed yet. Uh, this patient also had no metabolic crises after their transplant. And so the question was, well, why hadn't we always done this if, if this was something uh, that, that ended up being so successful? Uh, and it is because, you know, what we knew uh, is that the liver only contains about 9 to 13% of the body's total branch chain keto dehydrogenase complex. And so if you do a liver transplant for these patients, you're not providing an entire body cure. You're essentially just giving them about 10% of what a normal person has as it relates to this functioning protein. Um, and so this 1997 case, though, became kind of a proof of concept that this really could be something uh, that, that could be beneficial for this patient population. Um, again, this is uh, George's work from 2014, looking at our experience here. Uh, what you see uh, on, on the top is, um, you know, that the metabolic control of the various uh, uh, branch chain amino acids, uh, you know, kind of uh, pre-transplant, obviously there's a lot of variability. Um, Post-transplant, uh, you see that, uh, that variability tighten quite significantly. Uh, and on the right, what you see again is when they actually did, uh, you know, kind of formal neuropsychiatric testing on these patients, you didn't really see much improvement in their neuropsychiatric testing. So again, conclusion here was that uh, liver transplant may arrest the brain damage, but does not reverse it. Uh, just recently, Carol Ewing, uh, who's one of our great fourth year med students, um, uh, you know, kind of looked at uh, kind of long term metabolic control uh, in our uh, population. And, and what she found was that, uh, again, at the one to three, four to seven and eight to 10 years after liver transplant, the metabolic control in these patients is really sustained. Uh, so even though you're only providing a minority of protein supplementation, uh, that 10 percent is able to uh, really, uh, you know, kind of in long term maintain these patients uh, with excellent metabolic control, no metabolic crises, unrestricted free diet. They're not perfect. They're still about, you know, one to one and a half times above normal when you look at these levels, uh, but they're nowhere near levels that would create a crisis, similar to the uh, auxiliary transplants, for example, in the Krigler Najar uh, that we talked about earlier. Um, and again, what made this even more exciting uh, was uh, using these maple syrup urine uh, livers uh, that were explants as a new potential source. So again, not a surprise to anybody on this talk, but livers are in short supply. Lots of people are waiting for organs. Uh, very few organs out there are available. Um, we know, uh, again, that the current allocation system uh, can't overcome this shortage. And so uh, Ajay Khanna, who's now here, but when he was out in California, uh, put this paper together looking at the domino liver transplantation and maple syrup urine liver disease. Again, recognizing that since these uh, patients who are getting transplanted, you know, we're giving them 10% of their, uh, with their new liver of the branch chain dehydrogenase complex. But if you take their liver out and put it into somebody else, um, you know, that patient has 90% of their uh, complex in their muscles and other places in their body. So uh, again, uh, uh, Nestle Han, who was one of the transplant fellows uh, here a couple of years ago, and Ajay put this experience together of, of, of our um, uh, maple syrup domino liver transplants. Again, what you're doing here is uh, you're putting a deceased donor into an MSUD patient. You're taking their liver out and putting it into a, uh, another uh, recipient who does not have MSUD. And so uh, 21 patients, we performed this procedure on a median follow-up time of 6.4 years, 100% patient and graft survival, and no branch chain amino acid abnormalities in those recipients who received uh, domino organs. Um, you know, so I think, uh, you know, summary, uh, you know, kind of, of of metabolic liver disease, right, is that, it, you know, it's, it still maintains it's a fascinating group of diseases. Uh, there's a lot of interplay with multiple disciplines. Uh, you know, the conceptual understanding of pathways illuminates disease pathophysiology as well as treatment approaches. Uh, and transplant for these patients can really represent uh, a metabolic cure. Um, so kind of blew through that, uh, you know, 15 minutes left. Happy to take any questions or give people back a few minutes to uh, get some work done. Jim, it's Simon. That was that was great. Why do why do people always include cystic fibrosis in this group? Because it certainly doesn't fit with your um, definition of metabolic disease. So I, the question was, what Simon? Why are we why do we include it? Why why in all of these series is cystic fibrosis included as a metabolic disease when it really doesn't follow your pathway of what the, your definition of a metabolic disease is? Yeah, I'd say that's a good question, right? I mean, I, I, I didn't talk about it because it doesn't do that, right? Cystic fibrosis isn't, uh, you know, I, 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 maybe I'd ask you that. I, I don't know why uh, people, or Drew's on, he could weigh into that as well. Why, why cystic fibrosis gets grouped into, uh, you know, maybe since there's a genetic basis for it, people think it should be a metabolic liver disease, but. Well, um, we have 
we have allergies, which we don't include, which is a single gene defect. I think we have to try and differentiate between what's a metabolic disease and what's a single gene defect. I think it's an excellent point, right? I mean, and you know, I think what, what what is the definition of you know metabolic versus um, you know again uh, a structural result from a single gene defect versus mitochondrial uh, defect? You know, I mean, I think all these things sometimes there's there's it's a Venn diagram and likely there's overlap, but but I I would agree with you that you know uh, at least the way that I think about metabolic processes, you know, cystic fibrosis would would likely not be uh, included and would be more of a single defect that causes structural damage. Yeah, I, I would agree, Jim. Um, I, I think I agree with everything that's been said um, in the comments. I think a lot of people lump CF in there just because of, uh, like you said, the single gene defect. Um, uh, although, you know, more and more, I think people are, you know, characterizing all these things by the genetic defect. Um, and so CF is kind of by itself. I would point out it's similar. I mean, people still don't know what causes of liver disease in CF. It's similar to alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, though, where it's a it's a buildup of that abnormal uh, protein in the liver. And so people think that that uh, is playing a role. So it's, it's very similar to that. All right, folks. Well, thanks again for uh, attending the talk here. Uh, any questions, let me know. I'm happy to share these slides if anybody wants them. Um, uh, and have a good Friday.